Hey, writer, if you're ready to level up, then buckle up. Get your pen and paper ready. It's time for another episode of the Art and Business of Writing podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to another edition of the Art and Business of Writing podcast. I'm your host, Chris Jones, where today I'm joined by a very special person. Uh, Lori Marshall was uh, a high school teacher who influenced me when I was in junior high and eighth grade. And again, when I went to community college, she was one of the adjunct professors who took me under her wing and helped me to discover that I truly was an artist. Uh, I was going to college to become a teacher. I wanted to be an educator, uh, but she sat down with me and had me doing so much art to show me that my heart really was the heart of a creative. And from then I took off and I flourished and you know became a graphic designer, uh, became a writer. Here I am now podcasting, but she really was the person who watered and nurtured that creative seed that I really wasn't fully aware of. Uh, and so, She's a very special person to me. And so here's a little bit about Lori as we begin the episode. For 35 years, author, innovator, and artist Lori Marshall has empowered youth and adults through creative collaboration. She practices peace building through art inspired by nature. A visionary educator, she has served mostly low-income children, families, and their schools as an integrated arts and project-based learning specialist. Her mission is to nurture creativity, a love of learning, and a collaborative spirit. In addition, Laura is a certified K-12 art and social studies teacher with training in the Waldorf curriculum, conversational intelligence, peace literacy, and outward bound. Her BA from Antioch College in History and Education and MA in Art Education from Beacon College laid the groundwork for her innovative use of visual art and storytelling in consensus building, leadership training, and conflict prevention, with government organizations, schools, and businesses. She's based in Novato, California, with two grown sons and their families in Texas. Hey, Lori, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Chris. I'm very happy to be here and to reconnect with you after all these decades. I know. It's so exciting. I would tell people all the time that you had such a profound impact on my creative journey from the time I was a teenager up through being a young man at like 18, 19, 20, uh, and even just beyond, even now, like just all the things you taught me have left such uh, a powerful impression on my life and it's unforgettable. So thank you so much for all you've done for me. And of course, because you've done it for me, it all, you know, it automatically goes out to other people because the things you teach me will, you know, kind of reverberate off of me and they become lessons that get passed down. I love hearing those words, Chris. They, they are deeply gratifying. Thank you. Absolutely. So why don't you dive into the bio and let's just tell the audience about your creative journey. My creative journey began when I was 10 years old and telling stories to Peter, Marty, and Molly Bosted, who were younger than me. And I would make up stories that had their names in them. And we would go on adventures and slay monsters and overcome terrible obstacles. And I realized playing with them that I wanted to be a teacher and that I wanted to play with children creatively. And at that time also, I loved to draw. And the thing that I loved drawing the most was trees. And I tried to draw all the leaves on a tree and I got very frustrated. And somebody came by and said, oh, you can't draw the leaves on a tree. So that discouragement and my frustration meant that I stopped drawing altogether. And nobody told me I could draw the big, simple shape of the tree. I was also trained in Pittsburgh by Genevieve Jones, who was a modern dancer that had studied with um, Martha Graham. And she taught little kids like me how to move using our imagination. And that was profoundly important as well. I went on to go to Antioch College, where I studied American history and education and got certified as a teacher. And when I also got married very young, 
and that marriage didn't work out. And when I was 23 and we got divorced, I realized that I had very little information about my inner experience. I'm an extreme extrovert. I get much nourishment from being with people, but I didn't know what was going on with me. And I was so uh, crushed and hurt by this. I started to draw again and all this emotional information showed up in my drawings. And I thought, wow, this is so helpful. And <clears throat> I went on to um, begin to study art. And um, the education that I had at Antioch College was very practical. We did work in co-ops and then we came back and we studied about it and i have always loved education where the young people have a greater purpose than just getting an a in a classroom on a subject that has no interest and my um my work with art and with um education took me to become the gifted and talented teacher in rappahannock county virginia where I lived for 27 years, and I was on and off the gifted teacher, an artist in residence, and the, finally the art teacher at the high school. And in that period, I taught at the community college as well, and that's where <clears throat> the second time I met you, and the first time was when we made a great big collaborative painting called How in the World, which was uh, to a way of studying geography and current events. Um, and we painted this eight foot high by 16 feet wide painting. And I think maybe uh, four, high four middle schools participated in it. And each one did a different panel. And, um, and I just am amazed at the process that happens when you invite many people to collaborate together. A vision comes that can is uh, bigger than any of us alone. I went on to get a master's degree in um, community art, and um, at Beacon College before there was such a uh, field. And um, uh, Beacon College is now the Union Institute, and I got to design my own academic program, which involved making art with elders in Rappahannock County and with mentally challenged young people at a group home and with kids who were in the juvenile justice system in New York City and studied at the uh, Art Students League in New York City. And um, I just believe in creativity as the birthright of every human being that we come in creative and we come in with creator working through us to bring a unique imagination that no one else has. And we need everybody's unique imagination and everybody's problem solving abilities. And that's my, my work um, grew into a nonprofit called unity through creativity foundation, which was founded in 2020 uh, in 20, was one when I <clears throat> also began the Singing Tree Project, which was inspired when I had made a mural as an artist in residence um, in Leesburg. And Meredith Miller, who was uh, in third grade at the time, said, I wish the whole world could see our painting and then the whole world would be happy. Mm. And then she said, what if the whole world made a painting together? And that that question, that vision resonated so deeply with my longing to see human beings stop hurting each other, stop inflicting needless suffering, and create something beautiful together. And just at that time, somebody handed me the book, The Singing Tree by Kate Serity, which in, has a story of her father's experience in World War I in Hungary when one night all the soldiers in his battalion crawled on their bellies to escape the Russians and there was nothing alive. Everything had been destroyed by war. And when the dawn came, one tree that had survived had birds 
from hundreds of miles around who aren't normally together singing a song that had never been sung before. And our earth is like the singing tree of the galaxy because there's no place around us for billions of miles. There's no life that we know of. And we can choose to either destroy each other or to create beauty that's never been seen before as stewards. And from that time, there are now 100 murals, and it's been 20 years. And I'm having a celebration of peace building through art inspired by nature on October 2nd this year, which is Gandhi's birthday. So that is some of my trajectory, Mr. Jones. Wow, what a journey. I, like, I love hearing all that. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing all the things that you've done throughout the course of your creative life. Uh, it's, it's, it's something else. And something you said that I really want to dive into is you talked about creativity as a birthright. When you say that, what do you mean specifically? Every child is curious and experimental. That's what creativity is made up of. Curiosity and experimenting. <laughs> um, when you're creative, you don't do what's been done before. You say, oh, let me try this. Um, um, our um, way of fostering development of children, in my mind, should protect that fiercely. That curiosity and that experimentation. And it's called play. Um, and um, if we feed that, then that just grows and blossoms like crazy. And it's what we need to be able to solve the incredible challenges that we're facing of, you know, how do you build houses that don't burn up? How do you make housing quickly for people that are caught in floods and fires and hurricanes and tornadoes? Um, um, how do we solve the issue of people needing to migrate from the areas that are drought stricken we need everyone's imagination and creativity and our education system should be dedicated to preserving that and because mastery is such a deeply rooted drive in human beings as daniel pink articulated so beautifully in his book called drive um kids will learn the skills they need you do not have to drill and kill Kids will want to learn, how do I communicate about my great idea? Oh, I need to write. How do I research um, how to make this idea better? Because we have this drive for mastery. And so our schools focus on, uh, on skills instead of on creativity. And it's, uh, it crushes the creativity it's no, that, I, I think you're absolutely right. And it's funny because that's the one thing that when we talk about brilliant minds who've, we've, who've kind of crossed our space, even in the last 50, 60, 70 years, look at guys like Albert Einstein, who just harped on the ability of the imaginative mind to do yes. things. And the same thing with Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was just a guy who was just 100%, everything revolves around imagination. And people love all the gadgets that he has, but where's the appreciation of the imagination behind all that? Exactly. And we all come in with it. There's no child that is not born creative. And there's no child that is not born loving. And that is how humans come in. And I believe that's how, you know, we have the next 10 years in on planet Earth are going to determine the next thousand years on planet Earth. And mm. We need our hearts to connect to each other, and we need our imaginations to connect with each other. And whether we can turn this big ship around that is going towards suicidal warfare with nature. And um, if you care about your children, your grandchildren, and the people that are coming after us, it is time to really think together how we can envision the world we want and make it happen. And the world I want is a world that works for all living beings. And I, it's very humbling. 
I'm not sure how to make it happen, but I know that we have to paint the picture of what we want or we'll never get there. I don't want a world with just a few people flourishing and just a few species flourishing because it doesn't last. It won't last. No, agreed. And when you look, when you look over the course of history, the span of history, all the stuff that we study, we study the ancient Egyptians, we study the ancient Romans, the ancient Greeks, European civilizations, African civilizations, all these civilizations, like the crux, like the heart of their civilization is surrounded by art and creativity. Mm-hmm. Everything flowed out of that. Their mm-hmm. entire society and it's like we've gotten. I feel like we've gotten so far away from that. Like how yeah. how how do we recapture the essence of that as a society now, as, as artists and as writers, uh, as filmmakers, like as creative people? How do we help the people around us? You know, how do we rekindle that in our own society? Um, that's such a fabulous question, Chris. And I think it comes from <clears throat> making sure that that creative fire is alive within each of us. And when we uh, create, we also fight depression. Right now, as a species, we are grieving. We are grieving the loss of our own personal dreams. We're grieving the loss of the village. We're grieving the loss of ecosystems. Um, We're grieving the loss of loved ones. And um, in order to make the world we want. We have to process that grief. Don't pretend it's not happening. Turn it into something beautiful and communicable and use it. To, the reason we have so much grief is because we have so much love. So being love, being a stand for love and being a stand for creator, which is the creative force, which is our planet Earth, means that everyone we come in contact with, we are having the conversation about how do we work together for the sake of the children? How do we do that? It means a lot of things fall by the wayside that aren't important, like power struggles. And we have to do it individually, each of us standing up, being a stand for love and for the future and for children in every conversation we have. And take it from there, you know, wherever your path leads you, whatever your circle is, talk about just be love with those people and be love for the planet and see where, what projects come out of that and what organizations. And that's good. And that was actually going to be my next question. Cause we, it's like, you know, we hear about all these things that go on around us all the time. And it's like, it it can almost be overwhelming to our hearts, you know, that we see all the stuff going on around us. So how do we take it from that mic, that, that macro level of everything to a micro level of, okay, it starts with me. How do I influence people with my art, with my creativity? What, what, What are some initial like first steps that a person can do to exert more influence with their creativity and their art? Those are beautiful questions, too. And um, you are a writer and you support writing. And I am also a writer. Um, So telling our story is uh, very key and telling it um, through many creative mediums. And videos are obviously a very powerful medium of our time, um, as are making books, as are making art. and Um, I begin with making large murals because I want peace to be big, loud, and beautiful because uh, war and violence is big, loud, and ugly. (laughs) So I want to compete in that way. Um, There are organizations who are looking at the local ecosystem. So you are an ecosystem. I am an ecosystem. Ecosystems are interdependent. Where do I get my food? Who is giving the food? What is the cost of the food to the land and to the people? I get some of my food from uh, people who are picking strawberries in central California who are not legally here, whose children have been uh, separated from them. So, as an individual, that breaks my heart, and I'm making uh, the singing tree, the mahogany singing tree, to reunite children with their families, which is an 11 foot high by 7 foot wide mural. 
We're making a leaf for each of the 368 children who are still separated. And uh, I've invited people in to make leaves. We're almost complete with those 300 leaves. Well, I want to share this image with Jill Biden, um, who is on the task force to reunite children with their families. And to be perfectly frank, Chris, I don't know how to transform the world. I know I start with what breaks my heart and what I can do about it and um, and listen to other people that are already uh, trying to do something about it and trying to support it. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's a perfect answer. Um, I know that, you know, people, like I said, people want to get involved. They want to do things. And so just if we can, yeah, just being able to break it down to the smallest you know, influence. Like, what can I do? What can I do? Yeah, I guess. I think. I guess the, the long answer or the the short answer is just do you do it. Like you said, do it. Yes. You happy? Do it. Make you know. Do it. Sets your soul on fire. And yes. then make And make that you know kind of you know go out from you as a person and touch the lives of people who also feel the same. That is adulting. To do you. To really <laughs> to do the work of who you are and what is it that that um um sparks you and breaks your heart and that make, brings you joy. Um, those things are very interconnected and there'll never be another you in this planet, in this form. Um, and uh, we can support each other's genius. And my definition of genius is um, action plus unique, committed action, plus uh, uniqueness. And so we all have genius. And a lot of people just don't, they just do what they're told um, and try to fit in, which I totally understand because uh, that's survival for many people. No, indeed so. So for, for people who, you know, who create things and feel like their art, isn't going to make a difference or isn't going to matter. Why is it important to reframe that? And I guess take that, take that from an inward, like, okay, it's about me and it's about my feelings right now to there's a greater good for me to do. There's a greater service for me to do if I just let my art fly. Like, why is it important for people to shift that perspective so that they're not like, you know what I mean? So they're not hoarding their art inwardly, but instead they're pushing it out and saying, okay, you know, yeah, I, I'm not sure what's going to happen. I'm not sure how people are going to receive it, but I feel like there's a message that has to be said. That's a beautiful question. You know, ideas come to us. Where do they come from? I think they come from the angels. I think they come from the creator. And they come because they're needed. And when I make a singing tree mural, the largest one was 14 feet high by eight feet wide with uh, 1,200 people in a middle school community in San Francisco, I said to everyone, the project needs your ideas. Anything that comes to you, it comes because it's being sent for the project. And that's true for your individual art as well. We are one great big nervous system, we humans. We have eight billion bodies. We are faced with a challenge that is greater than any challenge the species has ever been faced with. And um, every one of us has a part. Just like in an ecosystem, the worms have a role to play that the, uh, the mycelium connecting the roots of the trees have a role to play. The wasp that fertilizes the fig has a role to play. And we humans have a role to play <clears throat> with each other to be stewards of this exquisite life that we've been given on the planet. And whatever imagery is flowing through you is needed. And I ask you also to envision the world you want. It's a lot of art is just reflected, is a reflection of how bad things are. And I think that has a, a purpose. Um, I want to honor that as a purpose to speak the truth. I also 
invite you to envision the world you want because energy grows where it flows. And so if you put your energy into fighting um, how bad things are, that can take a lot of your energy. If you put your energy into envisioning the world you want, that can take us closer. Now, energy, of course, as we all know, is it's one of those things where it can be influenced for for positive. It can be influenced for negative. Like, like how do like how do you cu- well? First of all, question one: like, how do you cultivate your own energy so that you're like, you're always in a great sense of creative? Uh, through love, through loving my life, through loving my body, through loving my um, heart, my brain, my lungs, my hands, my feet, through the gratitude that I get to experience life now. And when I connect with that love, I am connected to nature because I'm part of nature. And nature is inherent and inherently generative. Look at how many seeds there are in one sycamore seed, one of those monkey balls. Think about the seeds that are in a fig, one fig, and how many figs are on a tree. Think about all of the different species of orchids that are being, um, that have been created this year in Costa Rica. So we're, when I focus on this amazing source of life and love that I have been blessed with, then if things flow, ideas flow. And it gives me a framework that's not fear-based. And our fear-based frameworks are uh, cause terrible suffering. I can agree 100% on that. I, I think that, you know, contentment is, it's, uh, it's underappreciated <laughs> yeah. in our society. Like, you know, we always either want, we want more, we want more, we want this, we want that. But just, just having a little bit of contentment can go a long way, especially with creativity. I think creativity thrives in contentment. Yes. And it also thrives on longing. And um, I long for a world where children don't suffer. I long for a world where their parents don't suffer and the elders don't suffer. And we're going to suffer enough because we're all going to die and we're all going to lose our loved ones and we're all going to lose this, these precious, beautiful bodies. And um, the additional suffering that humans inflict on each other makes me crazy. I can't stand it. And <laughs> I want it to go away. And, yeah, and our culture tells stories that force and violence are the way to solve our problems. So and there's term- a bigger story. Yeah, so so in terms of creative energy, you know, when it when it comes to wanting to do things with your energy that are positive, things that are going to make a difference in the world, how how protective of you should should you be of that energy? Like I know for myself, like I know there are certain people that I can tell, hey, look, I'm working on this project, or I'm going to be doing that, and this is the kind of impact I'm trying to have with the work I'm doing. And then there are certain people I just can't tell that to because then of course they bring the wet blankets along and they bring all the doubting along. And then of course you go from like, man, I've, I've got this amazing idea that I thought was going to be something great to now I'm second guessing everything that I do. Like how do we protect our creative energy? Um, you know, just from from doubt, from doubt, from people from outside, external influence. Well, I think it's it's wise to surround yourself with supportive people, um, and that includes, of course, people that will speak the truth in a way that's not um, naysaying, and um, but you know, say this doesn't work for me or this does work for me, um, and really, when I have focused on what a miracle it is that I get to be alive, then other people's shit doesn't matter as much. You know, yeah. I just, it just doesn't have the effect because, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing and I'm giving what I can give. And, and I need a team of people when I feel doubts, you know, that I can say, uh, you know, I remember when I first started the singing tree project Meredith said, what if the whole world made a painting together and I had a coach and 
I said, who am I to do that? You know, that's way too big. And she said, who are you not to? Um, so I love having coaches. I love trainings um, that strengthen me and give me more skills. So I'm always feeding my uh, positive uh, belief and connecting to people who are doing really positive things in the world, like the Pachamama Alliance, which helped Ecuador get uh, right, the rights of nature into their constitution as the first country on the planet to do that. And the Bioneers, which brings together indigenous leaders and scientists and artists and activists who are doing positive nature-based solutions around the planet. I love what you said there, like the the who uh, you know who am I not to? Uh, I think that's so important because I know we get we get you know ideas all the time, and I think I, I definitely feel like those ideas are divinely inspired. Like when something hits yes. me, it's it's definitely it's meant for me. It's not meant for somebody else. But typically, we are our first reaction is, "Wow, somebody ought to blank. Yeah. Somebody else, somebody ought to write a book about this, or someone ought to write a film about this, or someone should do a painting of this." And it's like, well, that somebody is supposed to be you. That's why you got the idea. Yes, you know. Uh, it's, it's it's amazing how, how uh, I think how we uh, catch the inspiration, but like not the message. <laughs> yes, it's, that's a great way to put it. So if there's any takeaway that people will have from our conversation today, Chris, I hope it's that you pick up your pen or your paintbrush or your hoe um, and listen to the divine messages that are coming to you. We need them. Absolutely. So what, let's, so, you know, as a creator, I mean, you've created powerfully over the years. What are some of your creative habits? What are some things that you do that to feed your creative self? I, because I'm an extrovert, I set up situations where I can be create, I can paint and draw with other people. I, I'm not someone who loves to be alone in the studio. And I, I do work sometimes alone in the studio, but I'd say 90% of the time I fellowship. Um, I'm training people now uh, to become singing tree facilitators, to learn how to use this methodology as a peace building through our tool. And this morning I met with the Singing Tree Guild and we made paintings about ourselves as a stand for peace. And we had a conversation about the word warrior and, and feeling like we wanted the, the discipline and the life and death urgency of a warrior. And that, that word doesn't quite capture being a stand for peace. So we painted about it together. Um, so I set up structures where I can be with people who are, are creating with me. And um, I so and I also set up time to be with children, to co-create with them. So that's my discipline. Ooh, I like they, that. They keep me, they stretch me and um, nourish me. That's very true. Kids have that effect. You know, I've got kids and uh, it's funny, like I had, I had taken a hiatus from podcasts, took a, took a while off, you know, just was managing family, getting work done. And my son, you know, I've been, I, I talked to him a lot about just being a producer, like, you know, I was like, you consume a lot of content, well, start producing your own content. I think it'd make a difference in just how you interact with the world. So he started producing his own content. He started getting on YouTube and making videos, started doing his little TikTok videos and Instagram videos. And so him and I had a little challenge back in the early part of summer. It's like, okay, for every video you do, I'll do a podcast. And so we just got to just having this like little creative marathons. And it's just, it's, it's amazing how much you feed off of each other. Cause the enthusiasm yes. of kids, kids won't let you off the hook. They'll be like, Hey, you're supposed to do a podcast right now. Hey, it's, have you recorded something this weekend? I'm like, Holy cow, you're more, you give me more accountability than my clients do. <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh, what a great idea. I can't wait to do that with my grinch. Grandsons. Yeah, yeah. It's it's so, it's so much fun. There's so much opportunity to create now with the internet, and uh, it's 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 phenomenal what kids can learn and do and try and be a part of. If you know if you're right. willing to allow your kids to do those things, because I mean we're in a very digital world, so it makes perfect sense to give them the opportunity to interact with that. 
I, and I still love the hands-on experience of drawing and painting and, um, and making story. And so another part of my practice is listening to children. And I listened to Deontay Webster when he wrote a story, The Flood of Kindness, uh, inspired by Hurricane Katrina when he was uh, in third grade. And we worked for six years and I did the illustrations and produced that book. Um, and so, you know, taking the, taking the stories that are coming to young people and making them big, loud and beautiful and, uh, and helping them grow it into many forms, like what begins as a YouTube video could turn into a painting, could turn into a book. Um, that you could hold that you can hold in your hand and and open it and watch it with somebody else you know there's all these different forms that are available to us and i love making youtube videos as well i love documenting the process of uh, making these collaborative murals and sharing the driving question of each mural which is uh you know what community heartbreak do you want to heal and then see what the conversation is that comes out of that and then put that in a youtube video it's, it's all fantastic oh i love that that's actually a really great idea like i love that whole concept of showing the work <laughs> you yes. know by a youtube video just like you know like hey this is the work this is what goes into the the work that you are enjoying you know that, that finished product that you really like here's what went into that mm -hmm. Showing that that behind the scenes process. So one other one other thing that I wanted to ask you about was um, something that's very also very important to creatives is is rest. You know how important is it for us to just get rest? You ask such great questions, and it's because you live the life. <laughs> so <laughs> I am past my householder phase of enlightenment, um, where I raised two sons and took care of uh, in house and then took care of my father until he passed away. And when you're in the householder phase of enlightenment and raising kids and earning a living and being a creative, rest is freaking hard. It's just hard. And I just support you doing the best you can and know that your children just get to be with your children really intensely for 25 years. Um, and that then you'll have another, you know, knock on wood, 30 years, 40 years to get more rest. So, <laughs> so do your best and, you know, kids get sick, elders get sick. Uh, it's, it's when we're fragile and vulnerable that the neat and tidy schedule goes away and yeah. things are there to help each other when the neat and tidy schedule goes away. It's so funny, like in the fitness industry, you know, there's like, you know, you work out like, you know, two days really intensely, then the third day is kind of like active rest. Well, go do cardio for like 45 minutes, you know, keep your body moving and idling. And uh, I've kind of adopted that entire concept of like having active rest. Because I know, yeah, when yeah. I've got kids, so it's like, okay, I'm creating a lot. And then when I need to go into like this active rest mode, when something I know has to be created around their schedule, I've got my pen and paper and I'm still kind of noodling ideas and thoughts. I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll work on these later. I used to get all the ideas out of my head. <laughs> that's, that's brilliant. That really makes a lot of sense. And one thing I also want to encourage people to do is, just as you did with your son, to enroll the children into the adult world much as much as you possibly can and to focus on the value of being a contributing member to the family as being the most important thing more important than success in school or um or sports um all those things are great and the and the main reason that kids the main thing that kids want is to be together with their family and appreciated and encouraged and to have faith in their ability to master things. And so there's a beautiful book I just read that I wish I had had when I was raising my kids called Hunt, Gather, Parent. And it's about 200,000 years of parenting that came from the hunter-gatherers 
that was not the Western colonizer way of parenting, which is that you control and force. And we get taught to control and force our kids a lot. And the, the way the hunter-gatherers did was they focused on enrolling the kids into the adult world at every opportunity and to, and to have complete self-regulation so that you're, as the parent, at peace, that you have that, that um, what was the word you used earlier? It wasn't serenity. I have to think. It, it was, you know, that you're, you bring to it this big picture, big heart understanding that when a kid messes up, either physically or emotionally, they do it because they're still a kid. And to have the main enticement always be, oh, look how you are acting like an adult. You have grown. You can handle this situation. Or you're just, you're just still a kid, right? This is normal. For you to fall apart when something doesn't go your way or to make a mess and now we'll all clean it up together and to not do things for the kids but to help them um, participate in the daily life of adulthood we do not make adulthood very sexy for kids no not even a little bit <laughs> and they are segregated and they are asked to do meaningless work and it's it's pressing to them. No, I, I fully, fully, fully agree with you on that. I, and I think the cool thing, you know, I had a conversation with Deborah Tillman a couple of episodes ago, and we talked about this whole idea of, you know, we talked about parenting. She's a parenting expert. And we talked about just parenting and being creative when you have your kids and giving them, you know, giving them tasks related to creativity, if, you know, teaching them creativity and showing them an appreciation of what you do and say, hey, look, you know, whatever your art is, it's art time. So right now, daddy's doing a podcast or daddy's writing, working on his book or daddy's working on a screenplay, whatever daddy's doing this creative. What do you want to do this creative right now? Do you want to draw? Do you want to record a video? Do you want to, you know, paint something and just getting the kids into that mode that, hey, look, wow, I'm kind of I'm in daddy's world a little bit here. And this exactly. is really fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very powerful. I just you know think about how kids learn to hunt, which was Daddy's world. Yeah, so they they um, they made the tools and they had they practiced and they you know, they had real tasks, and they also learned how much pain they can withstand through rites of passage, and. That's something else that our society doesn't give to kids. Uh, it's a safe way to understand that they're very capable of standing pain and enduring. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I don't know how to do it. I don't have answers. <laughs> I just know that we need to be a village for our children and, um, and believe in them. Yeah. And well, not okay. waste their time. No, exactly. Like I said, and I like I said, appreciate the work you do because it's very symbiotic, you know, where it's like you are interacting with the kids, the kids are interacting with you, you guys are interacting with the medium together. And I think, you know, as creative parents, we can do the same thing. Like, you know, if you're working on a book cover or whatever the case may be, you can show your kids because your kids are going to be brutally honest with you because kids are just honest like that anyway. But the cool thing about children's honesty is that their honesty comes out of love. Like they don't, they're not being honest. They're, they're not being brutally honest or, honest or critical out of competitive nature. Like maybe a friend might be or somebody else might be, but your kids are going to look at that and say, well, I don't know, daddy, I don't like that color. Can you change the color? Can we see it a different way? And like, I think it's kind of fun to involve your kids in that way. Yeah. They will, they will give you fabulous ideas. And I still consult my kids, you know, I'm, I'm working on this uh, October 2nd anniversary and I'm consulting my uh, sons and their <laughs> their beloveds about the wording and things and it uh, doesn't end all right so lastly final question and i'm gonna let you go <laughs> is you know we talked about the whole idea of a birthright you know and and when it comes to that sort of thing you know we've got people who who grew up who were probably artists you know who drew they created they wrote and they went off and did other things they maybe they became lawyers or doctors or you know 
professionals in other places because they were encouraged to do something with their lives, quote unquote, so to speak. And they weren't encouraged to be creative and artsy. So so for those people who kind of live in that shadow of art, where art still really kind of prods at them at the soul level, um, how do they reclaim that birthright? Like, what do they do? What, how, like, how do they say, okay, look, you know, I've, I've done all these professions, but there's still something unfulfilled within me. How do they get back to that birthright? That's a great question. You know, art is very undervalued in our culture and it's very challenging to earn a living from it. And, um, and yet it is extremely nourishing. And just what comes to my mind is to have a little book, a little blank book that you can write and draw and put your poems and put your soul into just a place for yourself where just as you were saying, you, you jot things down so that you don't carry them. Um, just have yourself a little journal and, and pour your creativity there and it will support your, your creativity and your straight world. Um, because the creativity is needed in every realm. Um, you know, the, the people that saw the World Trade Center, the, the um, people in the control towers, they didn't, they couldn't think outside the box that, that this was a weapon happening. And, you know, we need our imagination. We need to think outside our boxes in whatever field we're in so that if you, uh, draw a box in your little journal and then put yourself outside your box. <laughs> you will have started on your journal journey to reclaim your birthright and hang out with kids. They'll teach you. That's what Jesus meant when he said a child shall lead them. They are our imaginative keepers. Oh, amen. Absolutely. They are They're phenomenal. Wow, Lori, it's been uh, it's been a pleasure just to to talk art with you, to talk life, to talk creativity, to talk about just integrating our our entire whole being into our creative. Uh, just such a fun such a fun conversation. So, how can our audience interact with you now online? Like, where can they find you? They can find me at unitythroughcreativity.org and also singingtreeproject.org. And there are tons of videos about how the murals were made. And there's, uh, there's murals organized by year. Um, and uh, we'd love to have you sign up for our newsletter and come to our October 2nd celebration of 20 years of uh, believing in the beauty and power of collaboration and and that, that we can build a peaceful world together, and that we need to bring our energy to the world we want. So please join me. Thank you, Chris. Oh, thank you so much. Just uh, like I said, phenomenal conversation. And I just wish you the best in all your work. And we'll, of course, be in touch. Yes, indeed. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. How's that for inspiring? I hope you take action on one thing you learned in today's episode. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast and left a review on iTunes, I want to encourage you to do that too. Finally, be sure to visit chrisjonesinc.com to sign up for updates. Don't worry, I won't spam you. And we'll see you back here next week for another episode.